Okay, it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Jennifer Widom. Um, many of you uh, probably uh, know a little bit about uh, Jennifer. Um, among many things she has uh, done which uh, have earned her justifiable fame, the, uh, more, one of the more recent ones was uh, the first uh, MOOC in the area of database. And in fact, one of the very first MOOCs at all uh, that uh, she offered uh, about five years yep. ago? Yep, five years um, ago, four, and four and a half. Yeah, and uh, that was an eye-opener for everybody when she got 100,000 people signing up for her <laughs> MOOC. Um, and uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, she has a long history in uh, database uh, systems. Um, so she is uh, currently a professor at Stanford uh, and also associate dean uh, for faculty and academic affairs. Um, she has an interesting background. Her bachelor's degree is actually in music, not even in computer science. Uh, but there seems to be some nice uh, connections between music and computer science. Uh, I know of a few others who also moved from music to computer science. Um, and uh, then she did a PhD in Cornell uh, in 87 and uh, was at IBM for a while uh, before joining Stanford. Um, she's an ACM fellow and uh, member of National Academy of Engineering and American Arts and Sciences Academy and so forth. A lot of uh, achievements and honors. Uh, and uh, she has uh, also done a lot of other interesting stuff. Uh, she has actually sailed into India. I mean, she must be one of the few people in the modern era who have actually sailed uh, on her own boat with her family uh, from Thailand to Andamans. Um, and uh, she's uh, been camping and trekking uh, along the Rocky Mountains. And, and in Ladakh. And Oh, in Ladakh too? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, she's seen more of uh, India than I have. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to have her here today, and she'll tell us about some of the interesting things she's done. Thank, Thank you me. very much. How's the sound on the microphone? Is it good? I generally have a loud voice, so I don't want it to be too loud. So I'm going to talk today about my three favorite results, as you can see from the title of the talk. So I was asked to give a general talk recently for the SIGMOD conference. And it's actually hard to figure out how to give a sort of retrospective talk on what one has done. Um, but recently, I had been somewhere where people said, anytime you need to do something, three is a magic number. So I said, all right, let me just think about the three favorite things that I've worked on in my research career, my three favorite results, and put the talk together around that. And so that's what I'm going to do today, is tell you about my three favorite results. I generally like interactive talks. So I very much appreciate questions during the talk. We have time for questions during the talk. If anything is unclear, um, please feel free to raise your hand. And there may be one or two places where I ask you questions just to make sure you're engaged. So be ready for that. OK. So let me start by defining what favorite means. So I think we know what three means. Result is a sort of a matter of opinion, but you'll see what I consider a result. But favorite, things can be favorite for different reasons. And so I want to tell you right up front what favorite means for me. A favorite result is not for me one that won a best paper or a test of time award. And it's not even necessarily the result with the most influence. So it's really my personal philosophical favorites. And for each one, I'm going to tell you exactly why it is a favorite result. OK. And I'm not going to bring any of these on you, no surprises. I'm going to start by telling you what the three results are, and then we'll talk about them one at a time. So my three favorite results over my long career, you mentioned the year of my PhD was well, before many of you were born, I'm afraid to say. Um, the first one is called Data Guides. And Data Guides, and here are the three results. Data Guides is in the area of semi-structured data. And that result was in 1997. The second one is called CQL. It stands for the Continuous Query Language. It's in the area of data streams. And that was around 2002. And the third one I'm going to tell you about is ULDBs. It stands for Uncertain Lineage Databases. And that was in the area of uncertain data around 2006. So sorry to say I haven't had a favorite result in the last almost 10 years. I did spend part of that time sailing into India. Um, I did take a year off, actually, and travel, including that, the sailing that was referenced. And I've been department chair and 
all kinds of things, but those aren't great excuses. In any case, these are my, my three favorite results, and we're going to go through them one at a time. Before we do that, I want to tell you about the Stanford InfoLab patented five-part paper introduction. So that's a mouthful. The Stanford InfoLab is our database group. InfoLab sounds a little fancier. We have a few faculty in databases, and we work frequently as a group. And in that group, we've developed a methodology for writing the introduction to a paper. And in fact, that same methodology works very well for talks. And it's basically five questions that you need to answer in the introduction to describing, say, some result that you got. So guaranteed paper acceptance if you use this, uh, this five-step strategy, top secret Stanford InfoLab secret strategy. Unfortunately, we've had a few things rejected. But I do think it's a good methodology, and I'm going to be using it during the talk. So when you want to introduce a result, and this is typically, a, like I said, a paper or a talk, the first thing that you need to do is identify what the problem is that you're solving. It's surprising how many people forget to say what problem they're actually solving when they present a result. So what is the actual problem? Second. Why is it important? Nobody wants to hear about a result if it's not important for any reason. Third, why is it hard? So you have to motivate why this was a difficult problem to solve and, and why it's going to be important. Why hasn't it been solved already? Okay. And lastly, finally, what is our solution? And when we have students write papers, we literally make them answer these questions in the introduction, even writing them you know, there. And then before the paper's finalized, we'll take out the little headings. But it's a, good, it's a good methodology. For today, when I give you my three results, I'm going to be answering these questions for each of them. But I'm also going to be answering a sixth question, which is, why is it a favorite result? Um, well, four is general. Well, if it was so hard that it had, if the only reason it hadn't been solved already is that it was extremely hard, I probably wouldn't be able to solve it either. What four really means is what have people done to chip away at the problem? It's sort of the what's the landscape of work that's already been done and how am I advancing that one? Yeah, but it, that's a good point. Very good point. And thank you for the audience interaction. Like I said, I, I like it a lot. Okay, so. I'm going to launch right into the first result, which was called Data Guides. And the co I'm going to start by giving the, the context for the work. And again, you have to wind way back to 1997, which only a few of you in the room can actually do realistically. But I'll wind back for you. So the project was a project called LORE, which stood for Lightweight Object Repository. And we were actually working on a data integration project, a project for you know, bringing together multiple sources of data and trying to coordinate them. And in the context of that, we developed a data model for semi-structured data, which seemed useful for integrating data. And then the LORE project was specifically building a database system to manage that type of semi-structured data. So if you could read these words, which you can't, you'd say, LORE is a database management system. Here it says for XML, but we started with semi-structured data and then transitioned to XML. The student who worked on data guides is a student called Roy Goldman. I want to make sure to give everybody the proper, proper credit here. OK, so as I said, we were working on a project on data integration. We were looking at semi-structured data, which seemed like the right thing to do, because when you do data integration, different sources have different data, and you can't have a perfect matching of the structure. And we invented what we wanted our model to be, or our representation for data to be, and we decided on a directed labeled graph. And we called it the object exchange model. And I'm going to be using examples that come from literally 1997. I took them out of the papers. So the example that we frequently used was an example about restaurants. And I'm not sure how easily you can see this, but I just want to point out this is a directed labeled graph. So the, we have a root object. And then below it, we have other objects that are reached by labels. So this says we have two restaurants and we have a bar. When I turn, can you still hear the microphone OK? Not a problem. OK. Um, so and this restaurant has a name, an entree, a phone, and an owner. And you can see down here, there's little data at the leaves. 
Um, there's a huge mistake in this data that someone just pointed out recently with this talk. It's relevant to India. Darbar is an Indian restaurant. They wouldn't serve beef curry there, I don't think, at an Indian restaurant. So someone pointed that out to me recently, but somehow we had that in our running example. Anyway, what do you want to notice here is that it's semi-structured data. Not everything has to have the same structure. We can have some shared data down here. The bar, all it has is a name and so forth. So this is a directed labeled graph. This was the model that we were using. Now, I want to say immediately that this model could also, the same data could be represented in other models you might think of for semi-structured data. So for example, here's exactly the same data encoded in XML. And as I mentioned, when we were working on the project, XML emerged while we were working on it. And we transitioned from the object exchange model to XML. Um, nowadays, you might think of JSON um, as a semi-structured data representation. And here's that same data. All of these share the fact that they can have irregular structure and that they're self-describing. You don't have a separate schema. By the way, just so I can get a sense, how many people here are familiar with XML? Everybody, good. JSON? Most. OK, good. Just to get to understand. OK, so again, semi-structured data, what characterizes it is you don't have a fixed schema. It's self-describing because the schema is kind of in the data there. And that is also true, of course, in the object exchange model. OK, so that's what I'm going to use is the object exchange model. Uh, but you could think about it as XML if you'd like. OK, so back to the patented five-part paper introduction. Now we're going to go in what is the problem, why is it important, and so forth. We're going to go through these one at a time. OK, so what is the problem that was solved by this favorite result called data guides? It, we solved the problem of semi-structured data lacking a fixed schema. Or I'll say that's the problem that we solved. And I would say, well, that's an obvious problem. That's the whole point, is that semi-structured data doesn't have a fixed schema. So that's pretty easy. Um, that semi-structured data was even called schemaless or self-describing. How many people know what a schema is? Again, just, OK, OK, I've got a savvy audience here. Good. OK, so why is this problem important? Well, if you think about database management systems, they rely on a schema for a whole bunch of things. So most database systems, before you can put any data in the database, you declare the schema. You say, here's the structure of the data, here's what it's going to be, and the system will use it to store statistics about the data because it knows what the structure is. It will use it to build indexes over the data. It will use it for things like checking the validity of a query. If it knows what the, the if you look at a query, a query is going to describe the data and the this, this schema is needed to check whether those descriptions are type correct, for example, or even exist. Even the simplest thing of taking in a SQL query, select star, and expanding it to the attributes that come out in the answer, the schema is used. It's just used all over the place. Actually, if you think about a browser for a database or a query builder interface, it's, the schema is key to that as well. So if you start trying to build a database system without a schema, which is what we did, you quickly get into trouble. OK, so I hope I've convinced you it's important. Well, why is it hard? First of all, if you have the semi-structured self-describing data, you need to define what schema even means. Because you can't just say, this is the structure and this is going to be it. And in fact, the schema is in the data. So what you need to do, since the schema is sort of implicit, is have an algorithm to infer the schema from the data. Third, the schema might change any time the data changes. So in a regular database system, you declare the schema, it never changes. Or if you change it, it's a major upheaval on the database. Here, every time you insert or delete data, you might have this change to the schema. So you need some way to incrementally modify the schema as the data is updated. And then the schema can be as large as the data. If your data is extremely unstructured, Maybe each element is a different type, and so your schema, the data is just the same as the schema. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you that it's, been, it's a hard problem. That was number three. Why hasn't it been solved already? Well, back in 1997, that's easy to answer. At that time, actually, we were the only group that was actually building a database system for semi-structured data. So there was a lot of work on it. Like I mentioned, when we started doing it, we were using it for data exchange or data integration. It wasn't until you build a database system that you actually realize how important the schema is. OK. So finally, what is our solution to the problem? 
So our solution was to define something that we didn't quite call it a schema. We called it a structural summary of semi-structured data. And we gave a formal definition for what that means. I'm going to go through each of these fairly lightly because I don't have time to give a you know, whole hour on this one topic. A formal definition, algorithms for inferring and updating the, the structural summary, um, how it's used for indexing and statistics, which are two of the things the schema is used for, how it's used for query processing, and how it's used for the user interface. But we're going to plow through this pretty quickly. So here's a reminder of our example. We have the two restaurants um, with various, you can think of them as sub-objects sub or attributes, and then that one bar, okay? Here is the structural, well, sorry, first I'll give the formal definition and then I'll show you the structural summary or the data guide for that database. So what we, we, we originally called them structural summaries. One day we decided let's call it data guide. It's kind of a cool name um, and I think that's partly why it's stuck so well. Um, okay, so here's the formal definition. The data guide is an object in the object model. That's the first thing. So it's going to be represented in the same model. In other databases, schema is represented in the same model as well. In relational databases, the schema is actually stored in a table. Second, and here comes the important part, every unique path of labels in the database, so every path you can go through with labels, is going to appear in this data guide exactly one time. Okay? And I'll show you that in a moment. And third, there's no extraneous path. So if you have a path in the data guide, there is a path in the database that has the same labels. Okay, so here's our example again, and here is the data guide. Okay, so again, the, uh, the database and the data guide. And if you look, it satisfies all three of these. You, can, you, um, you could verify this offline, but it is obviously an OEM object. We have every path in the database is here. So we had a restaurant phone, we had a restaurant manager. Everything that appeared in the database appears here. And furthermore, every path that appears here appear, corresponds to a path in the database. Okay? So that is the data guide in this case. All right. Um, let me tell you now a little bit how the data guide is used. And by the way, let, a question I often get, and I'll, I'll just deflect this one right away, we allowed cyclic data in the, in the OEM model. In XML, it's harder to get cyclic data. We allowed it here. Cycles in the model, in the data, would result in cycles in the data guide. And then you would get that same, the definition would be satisfied even for paths of arbitrary length. So if you could go, you know, A, B, C, A, B, C, or whatever, around and around in the database, you would be able to do exactly the same thing in the data guide. And that's partly what made it hard, to tell you the truth. Okay, so indexing and statistics. We have this data guide sitting there for this unstructured database, and then we augmented it with other information that served as our indexes and our statistics for the database. So one thing we did is at every node in the data guide, we stored the object IDs for the corresponding nodes in the database. So right here, we have here for restaurant entree, the three nodes in the database that were reachable by restaurant entree were 6, 10, and 11. So that means if you have a query that's asking for the entrees of restaurants, you can actually just go down here straight to these um, objects and go straight and get them. You don't have to explore the whole database. This is effectively what was already known as a path index. It, well, we didn't invent the idea of an index that fo follows paths, but this we could put it there in the data guide. Um, and that was all, not only for the leaf nodes, but the internal nodes. So for restaurants here, these are the two nodes that were restaurants in the original database. We also added sample values, and we'll see those in our user interface. So for example, we added some, we would, if there were a large number of values, we'd just take a few, just so we could show the user. So this was example values of what you could reach from restaurant.name, down, down the restaurant name path. Next, for query processing, um, we had, what we did for query processing is we didn't want to give errors, actually. So one of the philosophies when you query semi-structured databases is that sometimes you don't really know what's in there or things that used to be there are not there any longer. And so instead of generating, generating errors, we had a warning system. And then we used that, uh, the data guide to generate warnings when queries tried to follow paths that didn't exist. 
So for example, if someone said, I want to find the entrees of the bars in the database. Right now, there are no entrees for bars. Maybe there were before, and maybe there will be later. So instead of generating an error for that query, we would give a warning. And we would do that not by exploring the whole database, because if you have a million bars, you don't want to explore all of them to discover none have an entree. So we would do that using the data guide, and it was much, much more efficient. And then we did something similar to that expansion of select star that I described for regular SQL databases. In our query language, we had sort of regular expressions to navigate down paths of the database. So for example, this query here says, find phones and addresses that follow any path. That star will match any path of any length. So find any phones or addresses in the database is what this is saying here. Again, this regular expression. If you tried to evaluate that over the database, you would have to explore the whole database to look for phones and addresses. But if you use the data guide, you can look and see where there are, which types of elements have phones and addresses, and then only explore those in the database. So again, it's, it's a kind of indexing in a certain way. Okay. Any questions yet on this? So far, so good. OK, we're going to go into the user interface a little bit. These user interfaces are going to look very old to you. Again, this was 1997. and 1997, they looked really cool. I'll just say that right now. So many database browsers, again, start with the schema of the database. So they'll, if you use a regular relational database, they'll show you the tables. And what we showed then was the data guide. And this is, this is going to be a little hard for you to read, but you don't have to read it. One of the databases that we used as an example was a database about our group, about our database group. And so that was sort of a medium-sized database, and it was semi-structured. So this is a browser for that database. This is actually the data guide. So it says the group has group members, projects, and publications. The members have name, email, and so on. Each of these is, you can think of this as, a, as the graph. And of course, not everybody has to have all of those elements. So this is the data guide satisfying the properties of the data guide. And you can open and close things and so on, pretty standard. So you could, users could browse the data guide. And then they could also look at information about specific paths. And this, is, um, this says, I want to learn about group members' original homes. And it gives sample values of where they came from. And then you could also formulate queries from this. So you could select things for the query result, and you could put conditions. And then that would go back to the data guide. This is, again, a visual query generator from the data guide. And this would be a query saying, I want group members whose position matches this string student who came from Nevada or New York and has been at Stanford more than two years. So this is how we use the data guide for visual query formulation. OK, so that's a quick. Uh, browse through some of the things we use the data guide for. Again, we used it for things that a schema is traditionally used for, but the main uh, goal was to, to figure this out for semi-structured data. OK, so why is it hard? So I'm sorry, I swapped the order of some of these questions. I should have mentioned that I was doing that. It's hard to explain why something is hard without at least explaining a little bit about what it is. OK, so there were some technical, some serious technical challenges. First of all, the data guide, by the definition I gave you, is not always unique. You can have multiple different data guides, multiple different objects, you know, graphs, for a database that satisfy those properties, that every path in the database is in the data guide, and every path in the data guide is in the database. Those were the two properties. And there, especially when you have you know, a DAG or cycles, um, so we define something called the strong data guide. And the most interesting thing is the strong data guide was not what's the minimal data guide. And I'm not going to go into exactly what the strong data guide is. Effectively, it said that the set of objects that are reachable by that path are, are unique. But it's too technical to go into here. But the challenge was that it wasn't just a minimal one that we wanted to use and the fact that there were multiple ones and that some were better than others for the purposes that we were using using it. Yeah, question. Yeah, if you have a cycle in your data guide, how can you have issue? If you can have infinite paths, which wouldn't happen in the actual database. You will only have a cycle in the data guide if you have a cycle in the database. No, in the database, if you have a cycle, then you have an infinite number of paths. Yeah. 
because every path in the database, which could be arbitrarily large, will be a path in the data guide. Yeah, it, the cycle thing was tricky, right? Not very tricky. Yep. But even with simple data guides, you can it, you can um, have even with fairly simple databases, you can have different data guides for the same database that satisfy the properties, and some are better than others. Yep. Second, the data guide isn't always small. Yes. Right. So there is, so the, let me go one more bullet and come back to your question. Okay. So the data guide isn't always small. Sometimes it could be very large, as I said, compared to the database. In fact, it could grow bigger than the database to satisfy our properties of a, a strong data guide. So we introduced the notion of approximate data guide, which actually would relax the notion that every path in the data guide appeared in the database. And that would, we could then actually make it smaller. And third, and this is why I'm coming, why I waited for a moment. Constructing the data guide was similar to, con to converting a non-deterministic non finite automata to a deterministic one. And there is there a notion of minimality. And that notion of minimality just wasn't right for what we wanted. So we would relax that notion of minimality. And what we wanted, it really was about being able to have a unique set of objects for our path index. That was what was, turned out to be important. Um, so by this, by the way, that's easy. In general, that particular con construction is easy for trees, harder for dags, even harder when you have cycles, and there's incremental maintenance issues as well. Now, what was your question? <coughs> and did I answer it? I think this answers it. Yeah, I thought it might. Yeah. Yes. So it's relaxing this third requirement. So the, the second requirement said every path in the database appears in the data guide. The third said every path that appears in the data guide appears in the database. By relaxing that third one, we were able to make smaller data guides. We'd have smaller data guides, but some of those paths wouldn't exist. So basically, we're merging things that really shouldn't be merged was the basic thing. Yeah. OK. Last question. I promised to answer why is it a favorite. This one is a real favorite. And the reason is, first of all, because when we did it, there were challenges of every type. We had to develop the foundations, just the basic definitions. There were real algorithmic challenges. And implementing was a challenge as well. So I like that. And then it had applications of every type, storage structures, query processing, user interface, very different applications of this particular result. The name, I think the name really stuck. People are still actually talking about data guides today believe it or not. And it, is a, it was a long time ago. So there, are, I, and the last thing I'm going to say is, among all of my results, this is the one that wins in terms of tenacity and longevity. And actually, the student, Roy Goldman, who graduated way back around that time, so now 18 years ago, I have this um, habit, whenever someone talks about data guides, I send, send them an email and say, they're still talking about data guides. And I still send him emails periodically. Now, I think if it had a really crummy name, I don't know whether it would have persisted quite as well. When we started, actually we started by calling it representative objects. And then we switched to structural summary. And then we switched to data guide. And I don't know, we'll never know whether the name was a contributor. But, it, but people are still using this result today. So that certainly makes it a favorite for me. OK, so that's the end of favorite number one. Any questions or more questions? Yes? Yes. No, that, that doesn't contribute to minimality. So minimality was just in the structure. And the sample values were random, more or less. No, we tried to make it clear that those were just sample values. And those are really just for people. That was more for exploration of the database to see the kind of values that were in there. And they were chosen randomly. Yeah. Yeah. So we made no guarantees about that. Yeah. But it's a good question. Anything else? OK. So let's move on to number two, which is CQL, the continuous query language. And I'll again start with the context, which is around 2002. And we're building 
At this time, a new kind of database system, again, this is what I like to do is actually build new kinds of database systems. And this one was to manage data streams. And you may have heard of data streams. The, I, the basic idea is that instead of having a monolithic database that sits on the disk and is relatively stable and you ask questions of it periodically, the data is coming as rapid streams. It could be sensor data, stock tickers, whatever, uh, Twitter feed. Uh, which didn't exist at the time. And so the data is streaming in, and the model there is instead of asking a query and getting an answer, you actually register a query. And then as the data streams, the answers to the, the query continuously stream out. And that's why it's called continuous query, because the query, the, the query sits there and the data goes through, unlike um, traditional databases where the data sits there and the queries go through. Okay, and the students involved in that, actually both Indian students, but neither from this IIT, we think we determined, right, neither of them came from here, but I don't remember which one, um, Arvind Arasu and Shivnath Babu. And Arvind is now at Microsoft Research, and Shivnath is a faculty member at Duke University. Okay, so I'm going to just go through the five things again. What is the problem? The problem is we were building a database system for data streams and we needed a declarative query language. Um, sorry, it went a little fast there. So you probably all know, but a declarative query language is a query language where you describe what you want out of the database it's, and you don't, you don't describe how to get it. So I want all employees that earn more than their manager. You just say that in the query, not you know, open this file and iterate through these tuples and then open that one and match. Okay, but you, again, it seems like a fairly uh, sophisticated audience, so you probably know that. Um, why is it important? I've always thought there were two key things to a database system, a declarative query language and transaction processing. So I would say a declarative query language is a key component of any database system. And again, I guess I'd say that's pretty obvious that that's um, something important if you're building a new kind of database system. All right. So why is it hard? And this I'm going to motivate quite a bit. If we want to reuse the SQL language to some extent in the area of data streams, it turns out the semantics, the meaning of the queries can be very subtle. And we'll see examples that, that show that. Um, in fact, I think even if you don't reuse SQL, the, the semantics of continuous queries over data streams are not at all obvious. And the semantics can actually have a significant effect on the implementation. I'm not going to go over that. I'm not going to have time to talk about that today. But if you ask a query on a stream, remember the query sits there and the stream goes through. What, the, what you can express, what your queries mean, could make the difference between being able to store a very small amount of data and continuously answer the query versus having to store all the data growing infinitely large. And just small differences can make a difference. Small differences in query semantics can make that difference between storing almost nothing and storing arbitrary large amounts of data. OK. So I'm going to stick with this why is it hard for a minute here and actually go into an example, specific example. How many people know SQL? OK, good. How many people know the continuous variation of SQL? OK, right. Uh, not many, but you've probably seen these types of examples now. OK, so this example is going to have a stream and it's going to have a table, OK? And the stream is, this is going to be an example that's keeping track of people who are accessing web pages, let's say. So the stream is going to be a stream of people looking at a URL. So this is going to be the URL and a user ID. So it's just going to keep saying, this URL was looked at by this user, this URL by this user, and so on. Lots of those coming along quickly. And then for users, we're going to have a table of information. So this can be relatively, relatively stable. It's going to have the user ID and the age of that user. Okay. So the continuous query that I'm going to ask is the average age of the viewers by URL in the last five minutes. So at every point of time, I want to know for each URL that was visited in the last five minutes, I'm going to presume a lot of people visited it, what is the average age of those users? Okay. So here is the query. Um, the only thing that's different in the syntactic expression of this query is this window here, which says, and this is just a standard in data streams windowing construct that says, look at the last five minutes of a stream. So this is just a very easy query. It says, take the last five minutes of the page views, then take the user table and join them, right? That's all I need to do. Group by the URL and give me the URL and the average age. 
Okay, so very straightforward, right? Everybody comfortable with that? Okay, what's the result of this query? I'm not going to show you that the semantics is subtle. Is this query giving me a stream? Is it giving me a relation, something else? I don't know. I don't think the answer to that is obvious. Okay? The query was easy to express using SQL, but what it actually means in the environment of a rapid data stream is not obvious. Second of all, what if you've got your five minute window of page views and in the middle of that a user's age changes? Does that change the result of the query? Did I want that to change or do I want the age at the time that they viewed? Not obvious either, in my opinion. Okay. So, that should motivate why it's hard, I hope, and we're going to come back to that example. Then the question is why, at the time, why hadn't it been solved already? So at that time, there were actually a few groups who were building databases for data streams. I'm just going to say the others didn't seem to worry that much about query semantics. So I have, I came from a programming languages background. I actually like to know what a query means before I implement it, where some of the other groups were, were just going more straight into the implementation. Okay, so now let's go into what our solution is. So the way we solved this problem, the philosophical way we solved it, was we decided to rely very heavily on the semantics of relational database systems. Relational database systems, they have a known semantics. People know what SQL or relational algebra means. And so if we could mostly rely on that and just extend it a little bit for data streams, maybe we would get something that was understandable. So, we have relations, and again, people really know what it means to run a SQL query or a relational algebra on relations. So we're going to start with that knowledge, and then we're going to add streams as an alternative. You saw we had a stream and a relation. And then we're just going to have ways of converting between streams and relations. So what we're going to say is when we ha put one of those windows on the stream, like that five-minute window, we're going to say that turns it into a relation. So now that five-minute window is just going to give us a table of tuples for that five minutes. And then we can operate on that like a relation. And then we're going to have operators, just a couple of them, that will take relations and turn them into streams. So we really focus, all we, all we have to do is define the semantics of these two, and this we can reuse, and that's how we decided to go about it. And I think it worked reasonably well. So let's go back to our example now. Okay. So we have our, um, it's the same example exactly. Our query is expressed exactly the same way. And now this views here, the five minute range, just turns into a relation by our definition. Okay? So the result in this case is a relation because the whole thing is having a relational interpretation. The only thing we had to do is turn that into a table. And so the result is a relation. That relation will be updated when time passes because that table will change when time passes. It'll um, be updated when new page views occur, okay? And it will be updated when ages change. So the answer to this is if someone views a page and their age changes while that page view is still in the window, the actual, it will update the average age for that URL, okay? Now, so that was the interpretation. Here is an, let's say instead of having a relation that changes, we'd actually like a stream as the output. So if we want a stream as the output, it's pretty simple. We just add this operator here called stream right here. And this meaning of this operator is that whenever something in the relation changes, it will just emit the change as a element on the stream. Okay? It's a little more subtle than that, which I'm not going to get into today, but that's the basic idea. Okay. The, Third and harder part is what if we want to use the user's age at the time of the page view in the answer, okay? And this is not beautiful, but doable. So just briefly, how do we do that? We actually take the from clause here and we generate a subquery that makes a stream out of the pairs of the user looking at the URL and their age at that time. So we sort of generate an intermediate stream that matches up those ages, and then we take the window on that stream instead of on the original stream, and that becomes our, that then turns into this relation, and then we do the rest. If you don't understand that, well, some people do, I think, but that's how we solve that particular problem. Okay. So, summary of our solution, we 
defined a precise what we called abstract semantics. And it said, OK, we'll take any semantics for relation to relation, like relational algebra. And then we just added on the stream to relation and relation to stream operators that I showed you. Then we had a concrete implementation, which was based on the SQL language for our relation to relation. The windows I showed you for um, going from streams to relations, and then stream operators to go the other way. And then we also added to the language a sampling construct, because in data streams, it's quite common to actually want to take a sample of the stream and operate on that instead. So that was the language called CQL. The other thing that we worked on, which I actually found extremely interesting, was query equivalences in this context. And again, and some other optimizations. But what's interesting, and this sort of comes back to the, um, the thing I described about whether you have to save an entire stream or you can just operate on small parts of it. We could take queries that described operating on the entire stream, and we could automatically translate them to equivalent queries in the language, actually, that just looked at the immediate elements of the stream. So that was pretty interesting. Again, um, not time to go into that here, but that was a, a fun part of the query language uh, work that we did at the time. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the CUU uses the graph to refer to continuous functions. Yep. Uh, that's another way you don't need any continuous uh, operations that you can do. Well, what I meant by continuous is just that the query sits there and runs forever until you turn it off. But you still do it explicitly. You still do it when, yes, yeah. I'm going to mention time briefly. But we assume nothing happens unless a stream element arrives. Well, no, or if the clock ticks. Yeah, so those are discrete things. The clock ticking or a stream element arriving are the two things that can advance the, yeah, that's a good, great question. Yeah. So we had a guiding principle for the project, or for the, the query language development, which is that easy queries should be easy to write. And we think we succeeded with that. And simple queries should do what you expect. Interestingly, it doesn't say anything about hard or complex queries. It doesn't say that hard ones should be easy to write. It doesn't say that complex ones should do what you expect. The language was, we, we definitely define a real semantics for the language, but it was not necessarily that easy to use when you got to the more difficult and complex queries. Um, to your question about time and ordering, time was actually a big deal, whether you'd always get your data. We had timestamps on the data stream. Would they always come in order? If there was a big lag, could you be sure that you weren't going to get one with an earlier timestamp? All of those were difficult issues. What we did was kind of literally brushed them under the rug by saying we had a lower layer that delivered well-behaved streams. They would come in timestamp order. And if there was a big lag, you knew you weren't going to get a really old one. So you could know that you were beyond a certain point. Yeah. You mean when we did an output, what timestamp would we put on it? So we would put on the time at which we computed that aggregate. Yeah. yeah. So that would typically be the last time. So if you had, yeah. We had a notion of a current time. So we had, in addition to the stream elements arriving, we would have the notion of now. We could talk about time forever, by the way. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. But I'd be happy to talk about it later. We will talk about it, yes. But it was a huge deal, the time business. Yes, absolutely. Um, part of the reason I added this was because it, it was a huge deal, but I wasn't going to go into it in the talk. Yep, yep. And it's, uh, some of that was just we had to make a decision. I'm not even sure we made the right one. But some you just see these alternatives. Yeah. OK, so why is it a favorite? I liked it because partly designing a new query language is underrated, I think, in the database community. Um, and it's very difficult to publish new languages, actually. And um, in fact, as a little aside, the previous project I talked about, we also developed a query language. It was called Laurel. It was a query language for semi-structured data and then for XML. We had a nightmare getting that published. Um, Finally, so we were trying to publish it and trying to publish it. Nobody wanted to publish the query language. Finally, one of my co-authors, Serge Beatable, um, was invited to be the editor of a brand new journal called the Journal of Digital Libraries back in 97. Um, that journal, by the way, only had one issue ever, volume one, number one, and then it folded. But he was invited to contribute a paper to volume one, number one. And we had this paper we couldn't publish. 
on that query language. So we put it in there, and it's still there, volume one, number one of the Journal of Digital Libraries. For years, that was one of the top 100 cited papers in computer science, in the whole field of computer science. So that just tells you that you know, just because you can't get something published doesn't mean it's not going to be important in the end. So remember that. So anyway, very difficult to publish query languages. People, somehow, this one actually got attention. So I was happy about that. Second, I think database people tend to ignore sometimes the need for precise semantics and just go forward with implementation. And even in the early days of SQL, I think there are some examples of SQL queries that would do different things on different systems because nobody had really thought about it very much. Um, and I think people here appreciated the challenges. Um, I would say not the name in this case. CQL was never a real catchy name. Okay, that's number two. Yes. Right. So I remember there was a paper, the VLDB 2009 or something, which uh, talked about the Oracle model and your model and things which were confusing between the two. And then right. Then they something else. Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I don't remember. The Oracle did take the language and do something with it, and I thought they were simplifying it, but maybe they went off in a different direction. There was an interesting paper which said that if you see the query, you have no idea what it means. If it's so. I still think we satisfied the requirement that simple ones do what you expect. Right. 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 It's the other ones. I agree. Right. Yep. But the problem doesn't go away. It's still an important Right. So what, what has happened in between since then? So there has been no standardization. <laughs> and you still have different systems doing different things. Right. And so when a, and it would be nice if there was standardization, but nobody's really taking it up for some reason. It's partly because it's worked on very disparate communities, I think. Um, I worked on trigger languages, one of the first things I worked on. And there it was a similar situation where it, it was very complicated for complicated cases. And the standard ended up just simplifying to the point where you could only write the things that you would do what you expect. That hasn't been done yet in data streams. Maybe it's yet to happen. I don't know. Yes, right, yes. And you, that's another way you can do it. And if it's imperative, then you sort of know what it's going to do, sort of, if you can read the code. Yeah. Right, yeah. So I don't know if there's an answer. I mean, th I think the one answer is if you simplify it enough, then everything will be understandable. But then maybe you can't do what you want. And the, in the trigger languages, the triggers are very simple. So for simple cases, that's great. But then if it's complicated, you have to write it in code. So it's hard to know where to draw the line. OK. Third and last is uncertain lineage databases. And again, I will set the context. So the context here is a project called TRIO. And TRIO was a project where we were building a system that, put, that had three things on equal footing. We said data, uncertainty, and lineage. Those were the three things we wanted in the project. And that was motivated by applications. We were thinking about scientific applications have uncertain data, and they often need lineage. I'm going to tell you about lineage. Um, entity resolution also. So we somehow had a number of applications that needed these things, and that was the project. Um, people who worked on this one, um, Omar Banjaloon, Anish Das Sarma, who I'm told is an IIT Bombay graduate, and Alon Halevi. OK, so what was the problem? Well, we're building another kind of database management system, once again, this time for uncertain data. And we needed a data model. Okay, So again, I think it's, it's sort of obvious um, that this is a problem. You have to have a data model of some type. Why is it important? I'm going to make a sweeping statement that thinking carefully about what your data model is, is fundamental to just about anything that you do in databases, actually, any research involving data. And I want to say right off, data model now is a, it's confusing. Model is probably not the right word. People use model now to mean something quite different, especially with machine learning becoming more popular. What I really mean is representation. How do you represent your data? We talked about the object, the directed labeled graph. That's a representation. XML, JSON are representations. And that's what I'm thinking of. Tables are representation. Okay? Key value pairs are representation. OK, so why is it hard? Sweeping statement, there was a strong tension when we were developing this data representation between having something that you could understand and something that was expressive enough. And I'm going to show this exactly. 
So I'm going to go into an example now, which is a database for solving crimes. Okay? And this crime-solving database is going to have two tables. One is witnesses seeing a car at the scene of a crime, okay? and people who drive a particular car. So very simple, obviously, but we've got a crime. We're trying to solve it. We're going to generate a list of suspects, which are people who, who drive a car that has been seen at, a, the, at the crime. But little twist is that this datum is uncertain. That means that when th we have some uh, tuple in this table, it seems the witness may have seen the car. Or they have see a car and they're not quite sure what type it is. I'll be more concrete about this. A person might drive a car, but we might not be sure. Criminals might not always register their cars, for example. And here I assume people know relational algebra, but in case you don't, this is just a simple join of the two tables saying we're going to pick out the persons who drive a car that matches at least one tuple in the other table. Okay, so That's simple stuff. All right. A little bit of background on uncertain databases. Everybody who works in this area agrees abstractly that a definition for uncertain database is that it's a database that captures the set of all possible certain databases. Okay? So we're going to we're using the relational model. So an uncertain database is a set of possible relational databases. And those are called possible instances for the database. This is standard in the field. So in this case, we might have Kathy who saw either a Honda or a Mazda. So that's representing two possible instances. Um, Amy might have seen an Acura, or maybe she didn't. A Honda is driven by Billy or Frank. We're not sure which one. Okay? The concrete representation that I'm going to use, is, all, and I'll show you it in table format in a moment, is two constructs, alternative values and question marks, which say maybe, presence or absence, we're not sure. In the work, we also had confidence values or probabilities, but I'm not going to use those today. So it's just going to be presence or absence or alternative values. So this particular list here, Kathy saw either a Honda or a Mazda. Now we've got an actual table. We relist it as Kathy Honda or Kathy Mazda. She saw one or the other. And Amy might have seen an Acura. So we have this tuple Amy Acura with a question mark. So this table has four possible instances. It's got the two possibilities for the first tuple, and then the presence or absence for the second. And those are independent, so you multiply them. And here's one with two possible instances. There's a Honda that's driven by either Billy or Frank. Okay, So that's our, our representation that we picked. Okay, Now, here comes why is it hard. Fundamentally, it's hard because this representation, this model I showed you, is not closed. And the definition of closed says, if I have data in my representation and I run a query over that data, I want the answer to also be representable. That's what closure means. Okay? That is not true in this model. I can run a query on this data and I can't represent the answer to the query in this representation. So that's bad news. So same data, except I've added now a couple more tuples here. I've added um, Jimmy, who drives a Toyota or a Mazda, and Hank, who drives a Honda. No question marks there, so there's, a, there's always going to be three tuples, but it's just which values are picked. So this has four possible instances. This has four possible instances, 16 possibilities together. And that's the database. By the way, anybody notice anything about the people in the database? Gender related. Guys are the criminals, and the women are the witnesses. Right. Which probably somewhat reflects reality, but anyway. OK. All right, so we want to generate our suspects, who are all going to be guys, by the way. Um, and we do that again with this query. So we're just going to join the two tables. A little more complicated now, because it's uncertain data. But we're going to join the two tables. And someone is going to be a suspect if they might drive a car that might have been seen at the crime. So these are possible suspects. Okay. So we join the two tables, and here's the answer we get. We get that Billy or Frank might be suspects, right? Maybe, maybe not. Jimmy might be a suspect, and Hank might be a suspect. Okay? That's the answer when we join the two tables. That does not correctly capture the possible instances in the answer. And this is where I'm going to ask you to tell me why and to see who's still with me here. 
Anybody know why this answer doesn't correctly capture the answer to the query? No. I could elaborate. <laughs> I just said no. It's not because yeah, the non-determinism. I'm just going to tell you that I was at ACM India a couple days ago in Trivandrum with a big audience largely of local students and one really bright undergraduate got this. I just sat there. I had like 300 people in the audience. And I just sat there and waited and waited until somebody got it. And this one kid just finally went like that. And he took a, he went out on a limb, but he got it right. So, all right, now you've been absolutely challenged. Yes. I think you're getting there. Yes, we've got, yep. Tell me more. I think you're getting the right idea. Anybody know why this is not the answer? Think about the possible instances in this answer. Yeah. No, that's not it. Pressure's on. Wait, you mean there'll be yet another tuple? No. Should I give you a hint? Anybody want a hint? So how many possible instances are here? Are here? There's three for this, right? Three possible, and two for this, and two for that. So we're talking about three times, two times, two possible instances. Is that right? You were, you were getting it. Try, try. Is every possible instance really a possible instance? Let's suppose Jimmy is in there. What does it mean if Jimmy is in there? What can we say about the world if Jimmy is in our possible result? Jimmy is in there because someone saw a Mazda or a Toyota. Right, so if Jimmy is in there, somebody saw a Mazda or a Toyota. Who? Kathy. What if she saw a Mazda? What didn't she see? A Honda. So if Kathy didn't see a Honda, Jimmy's in there. Jimmy being in there tells us that Kathy did not see a Honda. What do we know if Kathy didn't see a Honda? We know that Billy and Frank can't be in there, and neither can Hank, right? So in, so in fact, these are not the correct possible instances because this would allow both Jimmy and Hank to be in there. I think some of you were getting it, just didn't quite articulate it. Jimmy and Hank can't be in there at the same time. That would, be a, that would not be a correct answer because that would require two conflicting things to have happened. Make sense? Okay. And actually, we proved that you cannot capture the answer to this query in this data representation. It's actually impossible to do that. Okay? How much time do we have, by the way? Like zero, right? Okay, so I think we should probably go on at this point. I mean, I'm almost done. Why don't we just go on because I'm very close to done and then we can come back to this. Um, we solved this problem, uh, sorry. Why hasn't this been solved already? Very quick. Most other researchers in this area were working from a very theoretical point of view. So they cared about expressiveness a lot, but not about understandability. So they had quite complex models. But what was our solution? Our solution actually turned out to be to add lineage. Lineage says, where did data come from? I have data in my answer. Where did that come from? And we actually added, this is the representation here. You can think of it as pointers. We added to the result pointers that said, this says that the first alternative of tuple 31 came from the first alternative of 11 and this first alternative of 21. I tried making this slide with arrows. Which, and it got too messy. But you can think of these as arrows just pointing to the data that it came from. And then the interpretation of the result 
says, I only create the instances that are consistent where I don't actually pick inconsistent answers. I don't pick the presence or absence at the same time. And we proved that that correctly captures the answer. And in fact, with the lineage, ULDB is uncertain lineage database, it's closed. You can always, always represent the answer. And in fact, it's complete, which means you can represent any uncertain database, which is a strong property to have. OK. Why is it a favorite? And then we're done. Um, favorite because we conceived this project before we conceived the data model. And as I said, it was motivated by applications that needed uncertainty and lineage. And then we never imagined that this concept of lineage would be the key to representing uncertainty. Never imagined that that would happen. So was it implicit somehow in the applications? Was it an unconscious hunch? Was it divine intervention or pure luck? I don't know. But that was very nice how everything came together. And that's why it's a favorite. Definitely, definitely not the name. Our names seem to have gotten worse and worse over time. So anything in common among the favorites? Well, there's expressiveness. There's simplicity. There's efficiency. These things work against each other, I think. For data guides, we had expressiveness and simplicity, but they weren't all that efficient. Um, for CQL, I'd say expressive and efficient, but not necessarily simple. I think ULDBs actually really do get, get all of that. And I just wanted to say, I think a lot of the work I've done in retrospect has been trying to balance these goals, expressiveness, simplicity, and efficiency. And now I'm done. So thank you. More questions. Do we want to go back to the Some question? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go back to a question on the? Yeah, so everything could be expressed. We could take the, the model could be list the possible worlds. The problem is that can be exponential, right? So and my favorite example is let's say you have t just 10 tuples, each of, one, each of which could be present or absent. And then you want the aggregate of those, the sum of those 10 tuples, 2 to the 10th an possible answer. So it's better not to list them. Um, although you actually, for that particular example, you need to list them. But um, in general, listing the possible worlds is the possible instances is going to be not the way you literally want to represent it. And that's, in fact, sort of what the whole thing is about. How do you have a higher level, more compact representation of these possible instances? That's the crux of the problem, though I didn't put it that way. Yeah, it's a good question. Other questions? Yeah, how do we prove completeness? Because if we also take into account they're not, do you make it the non-monotonic logic? Well, well, we needed to. We do have negation, okay. yes. But what completeness means is that we can capture any uncertain database. I'm going to tell you that it's not a beautiful capturing, but you can. Uh, what I'm saying is, you give me any set of possible instances. Now, it's not described by the query; it's described by the possible instances. If you give me any set of possible instances, I can create a representation of that set of possible instances in my model. Okay, And I, I can do it by kind of encoding them and using lineage to point to them. Right? So it's a complicated construction, what actually. What happens if you just take non-deterministic data? Would you still be able to see? What do you mean by non-deterministic? Right, so yeah, so no, we have we can capture all of that, and we do it. Sometimes our lineage, we have a notion of negative lineage, like this doesn't exist. Our lineage actually ends up being not just pointers, but Boolean formulas. Yeah, so there's a lot of things I didn't tell you. There's no, no way I can cover all of that in a third of a one-hour talk. But these are good questions, and yeah, that one of the things I didn't tell you is that to get the full result, you have to have Boolean formulas for the lineage. Yep. Yes. Yeah. No, it's deterministic, actually. Yeah, yeah. We, it's deterministic. It's fast and it's approximate. 
and I'm trying to remember, it was a long time ago, but we might have even been able to dial how approximate it was. But I'm not, I wouldn't bet my life on it, right. Anything else? <laughs> Where is database research going to go? Um, well, it's going in a variety of directions. I think one of the most important right now is the combination of databases and machine learning. And I think it's important both technically and politically because this big data is trying to be grabbed by different communities and I think it's really important for those to get together. So I think that personally, the, not that I'm doing it myself, but work that is trying to marry those two areas um, and, and get the people in those fields together is most important. The other is obviously scalability. And so these systems that are highly scalable aren't always that easy to use. They're much harder, I think, than people like to advertise. So that's very important as well. There's examples of what I think is important. But I'm not a visionary, actually. So, yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you.